Good day, fellow investors, and welcome to the traditional stock market weekly news with a fundamental twist. Today we're going to discuss Janet Yellen resigning, we're going to discuss the Fed minutes, very important to read them at least once in your life if you haven't, then we're going to discuss youth unemployment and human capital and the effect of human capital on the wealth of nations, let's say, on development and on future potential and of course stock market returns and then we're going to conclude with house prices in relation to stock prices to discuss a little bit how stock prices move much sooner than something actually happens and much faster than house prices which is very very interesting and then I will end with a question for you whether there are any entrepreneurs watching this video. Let's immediately start. Janet Yellen said she will leave the Fed board even if she was expected to be there until 2024. Of course, I have already been discussing this, 71 years old, moral hazard. If what she has been doing was wrong, and it proves to be wrong in the next 10, 12, 15 years, she couldn't care less. She says, hasta la vista, I'm retiring, I'll be teaching, doing some speeches, and have a nice life, whatever happens. So, just a question, just something to think about. We really tend to think that the older a person is, the wiser the person is thanks to experience. However, somehow I come to the conclusion that the older the person is, the more in a powerful position the person is, just means that the person didn't make that much enemies during a lifetime. They are incredibly smart people, however they think a little bit different than the majority and they would do a great job perhaps painful in the short term, but great in the long term, in such positions. Unfortunately, such persons will never be presidents, will never be politicians, will never be central bank leaders, because that would hurt in the beginning. And that's something that creates enemies, people don't like it, nobody likes it, we are all wired for immediate gratification and not long-term gratification. So it's very interesting how it works, who is put in which position and who makes the calls on what will happen in our lives because it's all about our future, usually 60-70 year olds. I don't know if that is smart. Nevertheless, something to focus on and something to really read if you haven't ever read are the Fed minutes. It's a 10, 12, some, sometimes it goes to 20 pages, sometimes there are pictures, sometimes there aren't. However, it's what the Fed members have discussed in their Fed meeting. When they announce whether they will raise or lower the interest rate, they just tell what are their conclusions. In the Fed minutes, they tell what are their worries, what are their uncertainties, and by reading those minutes, you can see, okay, the Fed isn't that certain about what's going on. There are fears, there are mistakes, and so. So let's dig into the Fed minutes, just a few points, to see what you can get there and what you can learn from there that's very important for anything that will happen in the next 10, 20 years. Now, the big change in the attitude is that many participants observed that there was some likelihood that inflation might remain below 2% for the longer than they currently expected. So now, suddenly change in environment, inflation might remain below 2%. Why? Because secular influences, such as the effect of technological innovation, disrupting existing business models, that is likely of setting cyclical upward pressure on inflation and contributing to below target inflation. And here I want to discuss reflexivity again. Low interest rates, a lot of companies borrow at Daimler in Europe borrows at negative interest rates. It means that their cost of capital is below zero. It means that they can really be competitive around the world and produce cheaper cars and force other producers in the world to produce cheaper cars. So everything is cheaper also thanks to interest rates. I wonder why the Fed doesn't get it that there is potential correlation between low interest rates and low inflation. Even if economic theory would say that low interest rates would have to spur inflation higher. However, there is so much competition. The world, yes, is shifting from producing goods to services where you don't have so much demand for hard goods. And then, of course, services, cars, technology, software, everything is cheaper because 
cost of capital is cheaper. Perhaps when we will actually see higher interest rates, we will also in the long term see healthy inflation. However, the Fed doesn't get it because those in those boards are those people who haven't pissed off anybody during the last 50 years in their careers and they have slowly, slowly came to that position. If you piss off somebody by saying something different, by doing something contrarian, you won't become a Fed member. So that's life. So again, they are really sticking to economic theory instead of looking at new ways, new things that could disrupt that economic theory. One of my ideas is that low interest rates created still holding low inflation. What's also very important, in their comments regarding financial markets, participants generally judged that the financial conditions remain accommodative. Many forget that, but the economic environment we are living in, Europe, Japan, United States, is still a commodative, is still an environment of easing. If we feel, well, if we look at how much consumers are going to spend for Black Friday everywhere, there is craziness about Black Friday, Netherlands, where I live, in the States, and then nobody is worried about the economic environment because there is so much money and everything is good. However, people forget to realize that it is all thanks to central banks being still a commodative. That's something to really remember. If and when the tide turns, if it will ever turn, it will be a completely different ballgame. However, the Fed participants are a little bit worried about a potential build-up of financial imbalances thanks to high valuations. But then, immediately the conclusion was, it was noted, however, that elevated asset prices could be partly explained by a low natural rate of interest, which doesn't lead to potential reversal in valuations. So the stock market and high valuations, high asset prices are really fueling the economy because people are wealthier, they feel wealthier, they spend more, which does well for the economy. And even the Fed is now worried that a reversal in valuations would affect the economy, not just the stock market, but the economy. And therefore, we can be assured that the Fed will keep backing the S&P 500 because that's their goal as long as they can do it they will try to control it and keep stocks high which is very good for those invested and for those who know how to take advantage of the situation now something else i want to discuss today is the youth unemployment rate the youth unemployment rate if we go from the lower line to 2017 now we have germany very low close to seven percent then we have China, India below 10%, US at 11%, Brazil at 25% and Italy close to 40%. Youth unemployment measures unemployment among those looking for a job between 16 and 25 years old. Now, why do I mention this is very important? Because look at Italy, 40% of youngsters are unemployed. Imagine the human capital development gap that is created there. Because as they don't work, they don't develop the skills, they don't develop the competitiveness, they don't develop what will lead the country in the future. As we know, for example, Italy, in 10 years, 30% of the population will be above 65. But the young population will be unable to lead the country into better times. So if you really want to invest in the long term, I think youth unemployment and human capital is very, very important to watch. The quality of human capital. How many languages people speak? What is their education level? What is their global competitiveness from a human capital perspective? Very, very important. If you invest accordingly, you will see that you will profit in the long term. I'm very happy to see that China and India are doing amazingly on that field. Just a quick story on human capital. Two countries, similar countries, Jamaica and Singapore, both countries became independent in the 1960s, 1960s free, I think, from the Commonwealth. Now, Jamaica had agriculture, some mining, uh, resources, a great position, tourism position, great location, close to the US, and decided to develop tourism, take debt, invest, and base their economy on somebody else, tourists from the US. 
Singapore instead decided to develop human capital. Singapore was smaller than Jamaica, no natural resources, a lot of lowly skilled immigrants from India, from other Asian countries that used to work in the docks when it was under British rule. And then Singapore decided, okay, we'll dis- develop human capital. Jamaica decided we will develop tourism, just to make the story short. If you look what happened later, Jamaica, they started with a GDP per capita of $500. 50 years forward, Jamaica is close to 5000 Singapore, 50 years forward, is close to 50000 Difference between human capital development and something else. However, what is very interesting, if we look here from 1963, when they became independent, we can see that Jamaica was leading in the first four or five years. And then Singapore simply took off. This is because investments in tourism, yes, they improved the country immediately, but they lack to improve the human capital, which is essential for long-term economic development. So really focus on human capital, also on a personal note. If you develop yourself continuously, you have nothing to worry about recessions, about stock market crashes, finding a job, creating a life. The more you value, as Buffett would say, the best investment is always the one you make in yourself. So not so related to the stock market, but very, very interesting to see how that works and how that affects the whole economic system. Let's go to home prices and stock market. This is the home price index in blue and the stock market. As you can see from 2008, the stock market crashed extremely fast. The home price index was crashing at a much, much slower rate. Okay, stocks crashed from 1,500 points to 750 points, 50% the home price index just about 20%. And there is a big difference if you look, stocks bottomed in 2009, March 2009, home prices bottomed in March 2012. So there is a three year difference between the bottoming of stocks and home prices. Then home prices slowly started to recover following what happened in the stock market. And this is very interesting because it shows how stocks react very, very quickly because they are very liquid and a lot of speculators own stock. A lot of people try to speculate with stocks. However, real estate, there are different fundamentals and there really a lot of economic fundamentals are shown. Jobs, how many people can get the mortgage, what is the interest rate, what is the debt burden, on the community and so. So it's extremely interesting to follow how stocks and the stock market anticipates what's going on and what will happen in the economy and and reacts really irrationally, but how home prices really rationally slow down in a recession, fall, and then pick up as economic activity and monetary easing speeds up. So it's a very interesting time difference and something to really take advantage. If you're thinking about diversificating from real estate into stocks or from stocks into real estate, to really take advantage of difference between the effect the economy has on different asset classes. The same thing happened in the Netherlands. We can see that the home price index peaked in 2008, going into 2009, and then slowly, slowly declined until 2015 when you know who bought his real estate property in the Netherlands. Since then, prices have really recovered, especially around Amsterdam. Yay! (laughs) And I want to finish today with the question if there are any entrepreneurs there. We are discussing on this channel stock market where I share my fundamental, my macroeconomic research with some stock picks. Now, stock market investing is not so motivating, not so inspiring. You don't even know, but I have been teaching entrepreneurial finance for three years at university. And I loved the subject. The only problem was that my students didn't want to become entrepreneurs. When I would ask how many of you would like to become entrepreneurs, one out of 30 would say maybe. So I don't know how that comes that 20-year-olds, 21-year-olds, don't want to become entrepreneurs, or it was just in my school where I was teaching. Nevertheless, if there are any entrepreneurs here, I was thinking just for the motivation, just to do something really positive once, twice a week, 
to start an entrepreneurship channel where I would share my personal entrepreneurship path as I convinced myself from my teachings to quit my job and become an entrepreneur, what I learned being an assistant professor in entrepreneurial finance, woo, and so share a little bit science, a little bit knowledge, a little bit fundamentals, and then try to motivate anybody who wants to become an entrepreneur. Not become the next, next Facebook, but become financially independent. Let me know what you think about the entrepreneurship idea just to shake a bit my life, to make it positive. Stock market investing is mostly about risks, stock market analysis and calculations. Entrepreneurship is all about heart. So let me know if you'd like to watch videos about entrepreneurship in the comments. Thank you for watching. Click like if you like the content. Subscribe if you haven't yet. And I'll see you in the next video.